there is one election outcome we can be sure of, it's that someone will want to secede. Whether it was over slavery, the first black president, or the worst white president, it turns out the only thing more American than apple pie is the desire to divide that pie into smaller, warring slices of pie. I'm Francesca Fiorentini, and in this episode of Newsbroke, we're talking about the bizarre and bloody history of secessionist movements in the U.S. Who's behind some of them, and if secession has any real chance of success. Before I go on, subscribe to AJ Plus and make sure you turn on your notifications. Whether Joe Biden or Donald Trump wins the presidency, Americans on both sides of the political spectrum have levied threats. If Trump wins, Biden voter Bruce Springsteen is vowing to move to Australia. And if Biden wins, Trump voters are saying this. If Biden wins, we coming. And we coming strong. And if I feel I need to go overturn a fraudulent election, then nobody on earth is going to hold me back. The original Civil War has nothing on what's coming. You see, it's the same threat. <laughs> but there is another threat that's inevitable no matter who wins. Secession, calling for independence from the U.S. altogether. Secession is basically the you can't fire me, I quit of political movements. Americans have a long and unsuccessful history of seceding when things don't go our way. It might have something to do with our founding that glamorizes our secession from England, or because the slogan love it or leave it sounds less like a threat and more like a suggestion. But it doesn't help that after every election, our winner-take-all two-party system gives us visuals that reinforce the idea that we are divided, when in fact, we aren't all that different. More on that later. But secessionist movements have kind of been key to the creation of the country itself. Beginning in 1776, when the colony of Delaware broke from Pennsylvania, Maine was once part of Massachusetts, West Virginia and Kentucky were once part of Virginia. Wow, I had no idea that Kentucky was part of Virginia and then decided to go solo. Kentucky thought it was Beyonce, but turned out to be a Michelle. Of course, then came the biggie in the 1860s that resulted in the Civil War. And what do you know, it began with a presidential candidate named Abraham Lincoln and 10 slaveholding states who refused to put him on their ballots. When he won and there was talk of this out of touch, city dwelling northerner outlawing slavery, 11 states seceded. And once more for the people in the back and in the comments section, they lost. After the defeat of the Confederacy, the Supreme Court ruled that secession from the U.S. is unconstitutional, which is why now seceding is incredibly difficult to do. If a state wanted to secede, it would likely have to amend the Constitution, and that would take either approval from two-thirds of each branch of Congress or approval at a special constitutional convention, and then further approval from three-fourths of the states. Basically, seceding is incredibly hard. Like, we'd have better luck changing the flag to the sickos meme. Not a bad change. But that hasn't stopped Americans since the Civil War from trying. There have been many other movements in the United States for independence, coming either from entire states, from states within states, or from former colonies that never wanted to be states in the first place. And recent secessionist movements continue to gain steam as our country seemingly becomes more polarized politically, and our patchwork response to the coronavirus means we kinda need a new green book, just of all the states that believe in science. It's a super roundabout trip, but it's safer. Secessionist movements basically fall into two categories, liberal and urban initiatives and conservative and rural ones. Do you want a borderless ecological utopia or do you want more fracking sinkholes than immigrants? It's the Toby Keith versus Kendrick Lamar American divide, a wound I thought was healed by Lil Nas X's Old Town Road. Even that didn't last. Take the binational proposal by crunchy coast dwellers in a region that will surprise no one. From Vancouver through Seattle all the way down to Portland, Oregon, regional similarities have some dreaming of breaking away and forming a brand new country, the place they call Cascadia. I can smell the Tom's natural deodorant not working from here. All right, hippies, to the barricades. Arm thyselves to fight to the death for... Cascadia. I'd say it's more a state of mind than a real regional construct. It doesn't have economic legs. It doesn't have political legs. Vaguely has environmental and spirituality type of legs. That's, that's basically what's left. Aw, oh, man. 
Spiritual legs? Oh, come on, Libs, you can't tarot your way to a new nation. But the dream of Cascadia runs in direct opposition to their conservative counterpart in the same region. Well, some frustrated Oregon conservatives who find their state too liberal are now looking to leave it. The group called Move Oregon's Border for a Greater Idaho. Yes, the Greater Idaho movement, made up of the only people who've been to Idaho and thought, we need more of this. The Move Oregon's Border for a Greater Idaho movement actually got their measure onto three Oregon County ballots this year. Of course, there's probably zero chance it'll actually happen, but it's like that old saying, shoot for the moon. And even if you miss, Idaho police won't care that you literally took out a gun and shot at the moon. Uh, Cause gun laws there are pretty lax. There's even a secessionist movement in Northern Colorado, which in 2013 was on the ballot in some of the state's counties and actually passed in five. One farmer explained the urge to secede even though his family's lived there since 1869. Now he lives in a Colorado with legalized marijuana, new gun control regulations, and civil unions for gays. In my job that I had, I had many people of <clears throat> different sexual preferences. Mm -hmm. And some of them were like sons and daughters to me. But it is defined by God in the Bible, the marriage is between a man and a woman. Yes, they were like sons and daughters to me. And if my sons and daughters wanted to marry each other, well, that's fine. But same-sex marriage, that's against God. Let me get this straight. Colorado allows you to legally get high, marry who you love, and protects you from being gunned down in a movie theater, and you're mad about that? Maybe our differences are bigger than I thought. Of course, a lot of secession comes down to political and cultural discontent. Anybody who's a hardened secessionist, in the end, you're going to find just that doesn't like the other. And the other tends to be people with different colored skin or different cultural values than the ones they grew up with. That's a real diplomatic way of saying they're racist. Look, I don't want to pull an OK Boomer here, but there is truly a generational divide between those who were and were not raised on Sesame Street. Everyone's a different color there. There's a homeless gentleman, an addict, an immigrant, and a gay couple up the street. They all live together in harmony. As fringe as most of these movements are, some scholars say that the U.S. is closer to breaking apart today than it was at any time since the 1860s. I think that our odds of staying together over the next 20 to 30 years are 50-50 at best. I think that this is a growing trend in American politics as it gets more and more dysfunctional. Yeah, but America puts the fun in dysfunctional, and fundamentalist, and funeral. A lot of the divide stems from how toxic our national politics and the national conversation have become. And much of that has to do with the reaction to the election and re-election of the first black president, after which the White House received petitions from all 50 states to secede. One of the groups that lost it when Obama was elected was the Texas Nationalist Movement. We want freedom, total and complete freedom, secession. We are aware that stepping off into secession may in fact be a bloody war. We understand that the tree of freedom is occasionally watered with the blood of tyrants and patriots. They seem chill. In 2009, even then-Governor Rick Perry backed a resolution that affirmed Texas's sovereignty, giving the movement legitimacy. Then in 2018, a Texas gubernatorial candidate one-upped that move by changing his middle name to SECEDE, all caps. Man, that shows real commitment to a cause. I should just change my name to Francesca Reshoot Season 8 of Game of Thrones Fiorentini. The Texas nationalist movement basically springs up every time it looks like a Democratic president might win. In 2016, it saw a surge in interest with what felt like the imminent victory of Hillary Clinton. And this October, it launched Texit, a guide to Texas independence. Super cute. One's gotta wonder though, what'll happen when Texas eventually does go blue? Will Texas have to secede from itself? Welcome to Lil Texas, same old Tex, far less mechs.
On the other side of the aisle, the election of Donald Trump piqued liberal interest in a state like California seceding from the union. And Trump's all-out war on California hasn't helped dampen the intrigue. California is the biggest economy in the US, and the fifth biggest in the world thanks to agriculture, movies, tech, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. It contributes the most individual taxes to the federal budget of any state, and yet, as we've talked about on this show before, it's vastly underrepresented in Washington, something even a conservative conservative secessionist scholar acknowledges. California gives a lot more to the feds than it gets back. And we're at a separate country and didn't have to contribute towards the American military. It would save enough money to fund its own form of national health. Well, I am sold. <laughs> we should secede. Bye. Okay, I guess we should look into it a little more. There have been a number of liberal California secessionist groups. In 2015, organizers formed the California National Party with the slogan, Free the Bear, which is a perfect slogan for a secessionist movement because it sounds rad until you realize there's a fucking bear on the loose. In the wake of Donald Trump's election, the Yes California or Cal Exit organization also began to gain traction. Fun fact, its founder is a former Republican who voted for Trump and now lives in Russia, why Russia? Well, this was a fun and also somehow very predictable discovery in our research. It turns out that, just like its role in Brexit, Russia plays a role in fostering secessionist movements in the US too. It's part of Russia's efforts to sow discord within countries and at your Thanksgiving dinner table. Over the past few years, it's hosted the Dialogue of Nations conference that featured representatives of Yes California, the Texas Nationalist Movement, the self-proclaimed King of Hawaii, separatist movements from Spain, Ireland, and Italy, and John Hamm. Give it a rest, John. John Hammistan is not gonna happen. Yes, I would visit if it ever did. But besides if it's even possible, or would result in massive bloodshed, or is secretly being funded by the Russians, what's really wrong with secession? I mean, maybe there should be two Americas, one that's gay and fabulous, and greater Idaho. If you start indulging one secessionist movement, then you'll have to indulge another, and there would be no United States. Okay, I get it. Basically, it's the if you give a mouse a cookie theory. You know how it goes. If you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to want a glass of milk. If you form Greater Idaho, they're going to want Greatest Idaho, and then Greatestest Idaho, and then Greatestest Idaho to infinity, which is actually just Iowa. The real problem with secession is that it misunderstands the country and overstates our divisions. After all, our states aren't solidly blue or red. We're purple. Remember, red Michigan only went to Trump by about 10,000 votes, or the same amount of people who downloaded Quibi. Nor are all states homogenous in terms of race, religion, and ethnicity. More than half of African Americans live in red states, for example. All rural people aren't conservative, and not all city dwellers are liberal. Look at our Upper East Side president. We actually agree on way more than we think. 90% of us believe in background checks for gun sales, two-thirds of us believe in gay marriage and that we shouldn't overturn Roe v. Wade, 60% of us think the minimum wage should be $15 an hour, and a majority of us believe in Medicare for all. What I'm saying is, Bernie would have won! So while some of our divisions might feel insurmountable, left versus right, tacos versus potatoes, Toby Keith versus Kendrick Lamar, one of our biggest differences is between the powerful and the rest of us. In fact, that's why we're never reminded of our similarities by those in power. Because if the real majority of us ever did all pull together, united in the same direction, we might start running this country. And I, for one, can't wait. Thanks for watching Newsbroke. Make sure you're subscribed to AJ Plus right now and also stay tuned to our post-election live episode that we will be doing November 4th with a bunch of different experts and organizers. And also, if you want to hear more from me, I have a podcast called The Bituation Room. You should check it out and we will see you after election day.